the International Society for Biblical Hermeneutics, and I'm here with Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum of Ariel Ministries. Uh, this is our final session in our webinar on dispensationalism and rabbinic literature. And Dr. Fruchtenbaum will be speaking on the topic, Jesus among Shammai and Hillel. Uh, Arnold, thank you so much for joining us. Take it away. What I want to do in this session is define Pharisaism and the two different major schools of the Pharisees that were active up until AD 70, the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. And I'll do some readings from their, from their rabbinic writings about them, about certain decisions they made uh, and differentiate among themselves. And so, uh, and then we'll focus uh, towards the latter part in dealing with one specific issue that they, that they dwelt upon so we'll deal with the biblical view of divorce and remarriage and then how the rabbinic view interpreted those passages and things of that nature. So hopefully that will be proven to be helpful. Now, Parasitic Judaism began to develop in the intertestamental period. When the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity, there was a feeling among the leadership like Ezra that because the Jewish people went into captivity for disobeying the Torah, for disobeying the Mosaic law, for that reason, they must have a better knowledge of the law to avoid breaking it. Hosea the prophet declared, because of a lack of knowledge, my people perish. And so Ezra's goal was to overcome that problem of a lack of knowledge. So what Ezra did was develop a school called the School of the Supreme or the School of the Scribes. And he gathered the leadership of the spiritual leaders of Israel that came back from Babylonia, not all came back, but those that did come back, organized them into the school. And the goal was they would go to each of the 613 commandments God gave to Moses and expound upon them. Answer the question, what's involved in keeping them? What's involved in breaking them? and therefore uh, have a clear knowledge of what the requirements was and keep it and avoid not the divine discipline. So far, so good. He wasn't doing any different than any good Bible expositor does today, expounding the meaning of the text and then uh, applying it accordingly where it was applicable. After the first generation of um, the scribes passed away, came a second generation that uh, took the task a lot more seriously. And uh, their view was, it's not enough for us to only explain the Torah, the law. We need to um, build a fence around the Torah. Now, what would this fence consist of? New rules, new regulations that could be logically derived from the ritual 613. And therefore, they would uh, uh, clear, and therefore that extra laws will be surrounding the Torah, so the Jews might break the law of the scribes. They might break rabbinic law, but that might keep them from breaking through the fence and break the mosaic law and bring down another divine discipline. And so next several centuries, that's what they did. Over, over and over again, to each of the 613 commandments God actually gave to Israel, through Moses. They added sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands, for example, to the um, one commandment to uh, keep the Sabbath holy. They added about 1,500 1, new Sabbath rules and regulations. And the, uh, the first phase of this was the continuation of the scribes. And they developed what they called the oral law because all these new rules and regulations, they did not write those down. They simply memorized them. And by memory, it was passed down from, uh, uh, from Moses to Joshua, Joshua to, um, to the uh, judges, judges to the prophets, prophets to the men of the Sophim. And so what they eventually had to teach is that all these new laws didn't begin with the Sophim, didn't begin with us. We got it from uh, the prophets, we got it from the judges, we got it from Joshua, we got it from Moses, we got it from God. And that's how they tried to authenticate the importance of what became known as the oral law. 
Now, they used a form of logic that, that we call pill-pull. The Hebrew word pill-pull means something sharp, uh, sharp, something peppery. It refers to a form of rabbinic logic. That given a specific commandment, how many new ones can you logically derive from the original one? So I'll give an example of how that worked. And uh, so on. So, for example, Moses said, do not seethe or boil a kid, a baby goat, in the milk of its mother. Do not seethe a kid in its mother's milk. Now, the, now this was a common um, Canaanite practice. And whenever a mother goat gave birth to a newborn kid, they would take the kid away from the mother, milk the mother, and boil the meat of the baby goat in the milk of its mother as the first fruits offering to the god Baal or Baal. But Jews could not practice that kind of idolatry, therefore do not seed a kid in his mother's milk. Now, Moses got that rule about 1400 BC, but now it's 400 BC, a thousand years have passed. Nobody, Canaanites are not around anymore. Nobody remembers about why we shouldn't boil kids in mother's milk anymore. And so they came up uh, beginning to use that pill pull logic. This is how it works. Suppose you eat a piece of meat, and then you go ahead and with it drink a glass of milk. It's always possible that milk came from the meat of the mother you are now eating, uh, the meat that you are now eating. And therefore, you are violating the Torah. And so rule number one, Jews have to separate meat products from uh, dairy products. And to this day, all Orthodox Jews separate meat from, um, from dairy. But the um, pill pull logic went even further. Suppose uh, you, you had decided to eat a dairy meal for lunch. So you pull out a plate. You put on this plate a slab of cheese. And then from this, um, uh, you eat this cheese from the same plate. And then you wash it, you scrub it, but no matter how well you wash it or how well you scrub it, you might not see a small piece of meat still on the plate, small piece of cheese still on the plate. So in the evening, you have your meat meal, and so you bring out your uh, same plate, and you put the beef burger on the plate. And no matter how remote it's possible, the beef came from the milk of the mother you that's on that small piece of plate. And it picks up a small piece of milk, a small piece of cheese, and you eat it together. And once again, you violate the Torah. So Jews also have two separate uh, sets of dishes. One you use only for dairy, one you use, use only for milk, and so or used only for meat, and so on, and so on, and so on. So myriads of laws were issued. And, by the, and the, even the time of the Messiah arrives, so dealing with this kind of a thing, uh, there was already um, these two different schools of Pharisaism. But um, what they expected Jesus to do is to submit himself to both the Mosaic law, the written law, and the oral law. And that's something he refused to do. He affirmed firmly the Mosaic commandments, but not the, the, uh, the commandments of traditions. And so he rejected those, and that would lead to their rejecting, rejecting his messianic claims. Now, when you, get to the, um, when you get to the time of the 3rd century AD, there are fewer and fewer, fewer Jews in the land. There's less and less Jews available to put all this in memory. So only then was it permitted to write all of these commandments down, these oral law commandments down. And that was done in the year AD 220. At that point, the school of Sophim came to an end. And then came another school of rabbis called the, Amor, uh, the Amorayim, or the Tanaim, I should say. And the Tanaim took the laws of the Sophim and began to add more and more rules for regulations. And uh, they continued. And then came another school of rabbis called the Amorayim that built upon the commandments of the Sofrim and the, of the Tanaim. And so ultimately, what ended up is being two segments of the Talmud. The Mishnah segment, which is the product of the Sofrim and the Tanaim, and the, that's about a thousand pages of small print. 
but the uh, second, the next segment, which is called the Gemara, the size of the Antichrist. Encyclopedia Britannica, it's a massive piece of work, and that's an Aramaic. And you put the two parts together, that forms the Talmud. At the time that Messiah was born, there were two major schools of Pharisees, and this was the, uh, the school of Hillel and the school of uh, Shammai. The school of Shammai was much more tight, much more limited to the text, but the school of Hillel was much wider and a wider interpretation. Just to give you a difference in uh, the differentials, totally apart from what we'll be talking about in a few moments. Take the Feast of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. And most you, most people today understand this, Jewish people understand it, most many Gentiles understand it. And the first day you light one candle, second day two candles, third day three candles, and so on. So that was the practice we have today, but during the division of Hillel and Shammai, there were two different practices. The school of Hillel says on the first day, one candle, second day, two candles, third day, three candles. But Shammai said, no, you start with eight candles. You reduce each day by one candle. And so that was the system. And so when, it's, when AD 70 happened and Jerusalem and the temples destroyed, the rabbis felt we cannot continue this division. But otherwise, Judaism, especially rabbinic Judaism, will not survive. And so they issued a ruling. Both the words of Hillel and Shammai are the words of God. Both Hillel and Shammai are the words of God. But the Torah, the law, follows Hillel. How you, how you can make them both the words of God, but we now follow only Hillel, it escapes me, but that is the way the rabbis were able to summarize the two. So they disagreed on many issues. In a few areas, they continued to follow Shammai after AD 70, but the majority of the cases, they issued the differential between um, uh, following only Hillel, no longer following Shammai, though his words were also the words of God. And so there were many issues that they uh, fought over and disagreed over, but uh, that's the way it was. So with that basic background, let's deal with the issue of divorce and remarriage. What I want to do now is deal with the biblical perspective, but also be inserting or following the rabbinic perspective and the difference between what Hillel said about divorce and remarriage and the difference between what Shammai said between divorce and remarriage. Let's just deal with the Torah first. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, he deals with the issue of divorce and remarriage. In the verses 1, 2, and 3, there are five ifs. If, in verse 1, if a man take a wife and marries her, takes means a man has determined to accept and assume the responsibility of a marriage, and he marries a woman. And the Hebrew word is Baal, that he rules over her, he's the master over her. But basically means he assumes responsibility of headship, authority, and leadership in her life. The second part of verse 1, if it happens she finds no favor in his eyes because he found some unseemly thing in her. The phrase that happens is a potential dissatisfaction once they're married. She finds no favor. No matter how much she may try to do right by him, he simply finds no favor in her. And the reason is something about her turns him off. And uh, the Hebrew, the two Hebrew words means ervat davar. Ervat davar literally means a matter of nakedness, and the nakedness of a thing or something. The word does have sexual overtones, but the overtones that that is something uncleanness, indecency, unseemly, something shameful or offensive. Now, it is not referring to adultery, because adultery in the Mosaic law is not punishable by divorce. It's simply the adulterer or adulteress will be stoned to death, and that automatically frees the innocent party to remarry and so on. And furthermore, in not even all sex crimes were punishable by death, as we see from Exodus chapter 22, verses 16 and 17, 
Deuteronomy 22, verses 2 to 29. So the basic meaning of the passage in Deuteronomy is there is something that was sexually unfulfilling. Sexually unfulfilling. So in the last part of verse 1, if he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. This is a bill of divorcement and it's a, from the Mosaic law, it's a legal document he writes out. And this protects her on one hand from charges of adultery if she chooses to remarry because she was not guilty of adultery to begin with. He simply divorces her and if it's a legal divorce, she has the right to remarry. And the, in the Mosaic law, the divorce is the prerogative only of the husband. The wife cannot divorce him, only he can divorce the wife, not continues to be Israeli law to this day. Now, there are two different Hebrew phrases or words for divorce. The first one is shalor chisha, meaning the sending away of the wife. We never see the sending away of a husband. Only the sending away of a wife, as in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 19 and 29, and Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. The second key word is grusha, meaning trust out. This, this is a term for a divorced woman, and it's never found in the masculine, only found in the feminine, because only she can be thrust out. Examples are Leviticus 21, verses 7 and 14, chapter 22, verse 13, Numbers 13, verse 9. So the process is to write a bill of divorcement, place it in the hand of the wife, and force her to leave the premises. Now the only time there's a denial of divorce is based upon false accusation. We find this in the book of Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 to 19. And a person who seduced a virgin has, has to marry her and cannot divorce her. That's the point of Deuteronomy 22, verses 28 and 29. Then in verse 2, if she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, the use of the term shows divorce severs a marriage. He can now, she can now become a man's wife. Now that's the latter husband, difference between the latter husband, the one she, she married, and the former husband, the one that divorced her. And divorce automatically granted a person the right to remarry in the Mosaic law. Now, if now verse three, if the latter husband hates her and writes her a bill of divorcement and gives it into her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, who took her to be his wife? Now, if he hates her, this is the mental attitude. He's actually revulsed or displeased, and, it, and um, therefore she's divorced a second time. Then she's also again a free to remarry, or she becomes a middle that she's free to remarry. But there's a key element that's prohibited in verse 4. There could be no reconciliation possible with the first husband. She has become unclean. With respect to the first husband, she is off limits. She is not forbidden to be reconciled to the second husband, and she is not forbidden to marry a third one, which is the case with Israel in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. So the conclusions we can draw from uh, this passage of Deuteronomy, divorce is not commanded or encouraged even for sexual incompatibility. The law did not institute divorce. It only tolerated and regulated it. Divorce is not an option until every possibility of reconciliation has failed. There are special instructions about the priesthood. A priest could not ever marry a divorced woman. And that's the point of Leviticus chapter 21, verse 7 and verse 14. And um, in Leviticus chapter 22, verse 13, a divorced daughter of a priest was to be allowed to return to her home and not be penalized. In Numbers 30, verses 9 through 12, divorce response, divorcees were responsible for keeping her vows if she was not released from those vows by her husband while still married to him. 
that there is a later on another grounds for divorce in the books of Esau and Nehemiah. It was a command to Jews who were married to Gentiles that did not convert to the one God of Israel, that they must be divorced on the grounds of religious incompatibility. That's found in Ezra chapters 9 and 10 and Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 13 to 31. We should never forget God's own attitude in Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. God's attitude is he hates divorce. He hates divorce. So to summarize, in the Hebrew Bible, divorce was on two grounds allowed. Incompatibility in um, Deuteronomy, and uh, this would be in sexual incompatibility. In the case of Esau, the Almighty religious incompatibility. In fact, they were commanded to divorce their wives in those cases. As we come to the New Testament, the first passage is Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 32. It's a quotation of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. And in chapter 5, verse 31, he quotes the passage. And in verse 32, here we have Messiah's teaching. And the word I, referring to himself, is in Greek in the emphatic position. I am t- saying, saying this. This makes it authoritative. And the source is the same as that of Moses. Divorce and remarriage is wrong as a basic rule. Even in cases of immorality, the ideal is to work it out. But there's one grounds for divorce, and that is fornication. And the Greek word used is porneia, so from this word pornographic. That's a general term, however, for immorality of any kind. Adultery is only being one form of um, fornication, but not the only form. So adultery is no longer a capital crime, but it just merely grounds for divorce. And um, the, and the, and the Greek part is the present tense that now involves a continuous adult relationship should someone marry without the proper grounds for divorce. And by remarriage, she enters into a state of an adulterous relationship. So adultery is just one form of fornication, but not the only form. So in uh, capital in issues of a situation, she enters into another marriage. She becomes promiscuous. In Greek, that's also the past of the wives who, who enters into a marriage relationship that was because she is divorced. She initiates against her or former husband, and she's personally responsible because it was not a biblical divorce. There's no grounds for a marriage. The man marrying her can also commit adultery. So passively in Greek, he receives an adulterous state. The present tense, he continues living in a state of adulterous relationship. And the reason is she is without biblical grounds for divorce. So the basic point of the New Testament in this Matthew passage, illegitimate divorce does not dissolve a marriage union in the sight of God. Neither man nor woman are free to remarry. However, if the unbeliever in adulterous marriage has his slate um, wiped clean, in other words, he becomes a believer, he starts with a new slate, then he can be he can remarry. But as far as two believers marrying, and then divorcing, the emphasis primarily in 1 Corinthians 7 is they should remain single. Luke 16, 8, so simply reemphasizes the same passage. But the most detailed passage is in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. And here we'll enter into the rabbinic debate. It's parallel in Mark, chapter 10, verses 3 through 12, but the most detailed version of it is in Matthew's account verses 3 through 9 in Matthew 19. Now the school for, for Hillel always allowed for a wider interpretation. And what the way they interpreted the passage in Deuteronomy is a man can divorce his wife for any he reason he wants. This was the Pharisaic school of Hillel. So that if, a, if in the Fawum boils her soup and she burns her soup, that's grounds for divorce. Rabbi Kiva said, 
Grounds for divorce include if a man sees a prettier woman, he can divorce the wife and marry the prettier woman. Is the wife open to a dorm for any divorce for any reason whatsoever? But the school of Shammai was much more narrow in their interpretation, and that the and issue for the school of Shammai is only for, uh, for fornication. That's the only grounds for divorce that come to school of Shammai. As we shall about to see in this passage, the Messiah is identified as so closer to Shammai than he does with Hillel. And uh, so God's original will, will, according to Chen, Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, sexual union unites the male and the female into oneness, and it becomes a permanent union. So as a result of divine planning, God has done the yoking, and, the cons- and it is consummated on the wedding night. The choice of marriage is with the individual and with the vow taken. And by sexual union, God is doing the joining. So what God has joined together, let no one rent asunder. And that's the standard biblical New Testament um, standard. But the Pharisees now responded, is Moses in violation, and that's in verse 7, is Moses in violation of God's original design? Because after all, Moses did command a bill of divorcement. So Messiah answers in verses 8 and 9. The case of Moses is in verse 8. He reminded that Moses did not command a divorce. He only allowed it, he regulated it into its existing situation, but there was no command to divorce. He only regulated it. And the reason for the allowance of of allowing divorce to occur is because of what? The hardness of the human heart. So he put him but should be he permitted divorce, he did not command it. The original purpose was always the permanency of marriage. So the liberty of divorcing under Mosaic law is because of the hardness of hearts, but is no longer as a basis for the allowance of divorce. And so Messiah's regulation is spelled out in verse 9. The man who divorces his wife except for immorality and remarries, commits adultery against his wife. And Mark chapter 10, verse 12, adds an addition. The wife who divorces her husband, except for immorality, and remarries, commits adultery. Now, because Matthew does not add that, he's writing to a Jewish audience, the Jewish context of this day in Israel, the, ma- the, wa- the husband can divorce the wife, but the wife cannot divorce her husband. But Mark is writing to a Roman uh, audience, a Roman audience allowed divorce and remarriage to go both ways, so he asked that other element as well. So, so the one who marries a divorcee that is committing adultery. So the one divorcing on non-biblical grounds becomes guilty of two counts of adultery when he or she divorces him or her. He or she makes the divorcee commit adultery when he or she remarries. He or she makes the one marrying the divorcee commit adultery. He or she makes the one marrying the divorcee commit adultery. The man himself commits adultery when he divorces and then remarries. Adultery has the effect of dissolving the marriage before God. The guilty one has been joined to another. And the first Corinthians 6, verses 15 through 18, he points out people who have relationship with prostitutes, that, that's not a marriage. That's, that's not a marriage. And so they become one with the, um, with the um, prostitute, but it's not, that does not constitute a marriage. A book of marriage involves three things. Number one, a commitment. Number two, it involves a um, Marriage ceremony recognized as being the official marriage ceremony in whatever culture they may be in. In the case of Genesis, it was taking your bride into the tent of your mother, which is what Isaac did with Rebecca. He took her into Sarah's tent. And the third, the first sexual union. But uh, to claim that every time you have a sexual union with somebody, you married her, that's now that's not a biblical marriage, but it is immorality, and it is punishable by divine decree. 
So the conclusion is that adultery is grounds for divorce. Adultery is then the grounds for remarriage. And, um, and that's as far as we can go. Because the prohibited, the prohibited marriage in Matthew is only prohibited to the guilty party. It's not prohibited to the innocent party. Again, the ideal is forgiveness and reconciliation. But if that's not coming, then the innocent party, after divorcing the guilty party, the sweet and the guilty party is not free to remarry. One more passage that's important is 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 to 16. We leave and we put some instructions about married believers in verses 10 and 11. In God's direct, the will is. The wife is not to leave her husband. The husband is not to leave his wife. This is the verbalized teachings of the Messiah. And you see this in comparing Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32, and Luke chapter 16, verse 18, and Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 9, with Mark 10, verses 3 to 12. So God's permissive will, but if she leaves her husband, there's a recognition that divorce among two believers may occur. If so, another directive is given of God that, that comes into play. And the options for the divorcees in this situation is that they should remain unmarried, remain continuously unmarried, present tense, or be reconciled to each other. So the two believers divorce. They should remain single. They can be reconciled to each other. What they cannot do is marry anyone else. Now, in dealing with the uh, with the belief, so the uh, believer situation is a situation where if one member of the divorced party remarries or has sexual relations with anyone, that will terminate the marriage until that sexual union takes place by one or the other party, <coughs> that will terminate the marriage. It will free the innocent one to remarry. But it doesn't free the guilty one to remarry. <coughs> but the spouse that is guilty of every marriage has dissolved the marriage, and that the other spouse is free to remarry. But now in chapter 7, verses 12 to 16, he gives some instructions concerning mixed marriages. Suppose two unbelievers uh, marry. This is verse 12 and 13. And then because, and because, and then in the course of time, one of the two becomes a believer. But then the unbeliever wants a divorce because of that. Then the, the, the um, believing spouse is told to grant it. Don't fight it. Simply grant that divorce and be separated. And then the other spouse would be to be uh, allowed to be remarried. But as long as the unbelieving partner wants to remain with the spouse uh, because he or she has become a believer, then that's, then that's the way they should stay married. But this does not come by direct quotation of anything Messiah taught. But this comes by apostolic authority in chapter 7, verse 12. And the command, this command holds for the husband in verse 12, and the command holds for the wife in verse 13. The reason is in verse 14. The unbelieving partner is set apart. He becomes the target of prayer and the target of being witness to him. And if married to an unbeliever is sin, then the children would be illegitimate. But in the mixed marriage relationship, those children are still legitimate children and not illegitimate. And then in chapter 7, verse 1, if the unbeliever wishes, verse 14, if the unbeliever wishes to leave, then he should be allowed to leave. It's a Greek middle of words. So the initiative must come with the unbeliever. The believer should not initiate a divorce. But the unbeliever needs to initiate divorce. Now, where it might be legalistically necessary, it might be okay for the believer to uh, initiate the divorce, but it has to, the request has to come from the unbelieving mate. That's the ruling. 
In the passive voice, which is what Paul uses here, the believer receives freedom because of the unbeliever's desertion. And, uh, and then this, the indicative mood, which is what's being used here in Greek, then the, this, the, uh, free, the innocent person, the believer, is totally free. And he adds, not under bondage, meaning they're no longer under the marriage bond. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 27 and 28, no longer under the one flesh concept. So if you're bound to a life, he says, same root as the word bondage. If you're bound to a wife, then don't seek to be loosed. Don't seek to be divorced. But if you're divorced from a wife, don't seek another wife. But if you do remarry, you have not sinned. That presupposes that divorce is on legitimate biblical grounds and not otherwise. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, to be bound means to be married. Not to be bound means to, means to not to be married. And in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, we're freed from the marriage law, which binds. The conclusion we can reach from what we have seen from chapter 7 so far, the believer in such cases is free to remarry. So the phrase, let depart, is exactly the same as putting asunder. The marriage bond has been broken. At the end of verse 15 of chapter 7, and God has called us to peace, so we should not keep fighting about the divorce if the unbelieving mate wants to have it, then he should be granted and vice versa. So believers should not fight divorce for there is no guarantee by forcing the unbeliever to stay. The unbeliever could still be one. So let's summarize everything from the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament. There are four grounds for remarriage. Number one, the death of a mate. Secondly, immorality. Thirdly, desertion by the, uh, in this case, the unbelieving mate. And fourthly, single status at the point of salvation, which blots out anything in the past. Do believe it starts with a clean slate? This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. So there are some principles to be aware of. Number one, the liberal allowance for divorce, like sexually unfulfilling under the law, is limited under grace. Second principle, Legitimate divorce for allowance for divorce, sexually unfulfilling on the law, is also limited on the grace. Thirdly, neither the Old or New Testaments make divorce mandatory. It is never more than an option. And the ideal is always reconciliation, to forgive and to forget the mate's unfaithfulness. Fourth principle, God's original design is the permanency of marriage. Fifth principle, under grace, only two grounds for divorce, adultery and desertion. The sixth principle is, several divorce on any other grounds is not divorce in God's sight. Hence, the prohibition of remarriage. Hence, only other option is reconciliation. A remarriage in such situations involves an adulterous relationship. And to that situation, the best, is, the, best, the best solution is simply an annulment, not mere confession, an annulment. And the seventh principle of salvation after a series of marriages and divorces, if single at that point, you may remarry, if married, to remain with the one that you are married to at the time of your salvation. So the difference between biblical divorce in the Testament and the remitting development of the issue of uh, divorce and remarriage in Deuteronomy is quite different. In the issue of Shammai, when it, when it came for, per, for permission to divorce, Jesus did agree with the school of Shammai, did not agree with the school of Hillel. But the school of Hillel made divorce and remarriage very easy, very wide, and perhaps that's why that's the school that survived AD 70 and not the Shammai school. Sheila. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fruchtenbaum. <clears throat> okay.
got a question. So um, today people often use the term Pharisee in a sense that is derogatory. Uh, whenever they want to say that someone is being legalistic, they'll say he's a Pharisee, he's being Pharisaic. But as you mentioned, uh, it's the school of Hillel, not the school of Shammai that survived the 70 AD. And it's often said that Hillel loosened the law while Shammai tightened the law. So is it appropriate then to use the term Pharisee in a derogatory sense to mean legalistic if indeed the surviving Pharisaic school are those who were anti-legalistic? I've noticed, uh, if you may have noticed, is that nowadays, any time you emphasize that biblical law is to be obeyed, and often if they don't like that biblical law, then you're a Pharisee. Pharisaism was not condemned because of being to biblical law. They were con be condemned because there are many other rules and regulations which Moses never commanded. That's what made them legalistic. But obeying biblical law is exactly what believers should be doing. That's the way of spirituality. That's the way of developing maturity in the faith and things of that nature. But people have been using the term Pharisee rather loosely in our day. And I found coming from my Jewish perspective, it says, but this is the law of scripture. So this is not legalism. This is obedience. And obedience and legalism are two different things. So the legalism is um, obeying law, the insisting obeying laws that the Bible does not say. And then um, and so on. So for example, in, uh, in modern society, and it's got many different rules and regulations. And uh, it's interesting to note they never refer to those uh, legalistic as being legalisms. But when you, when you insist on believers keeping the law of Moses, and excuse me, law of the Messiah, the law of the New Testament, the law of God that we have to follow, that's when they begin accusing us to be Pharisees. Now, Pharisees... Um, didn't ever criticize Mosaic law. And nobody obeying Mosaic law is ever called the Pharisee. But Pharisees, were the, they added rules and regulations over and over and over again, and that's what made them legalists. And that's the problem with legalism. So in, in my years of schooling and Christian schools and so on, I was confronted uh, by what was actually legalism. So, for example, you are not allowed to uh, dance, you're not allowed to go to the, men and women cannot swim in the same beach at the same time, and many other rules and regulations. None of those are in Scripture. When I called upon scriptural laws of obedience, then, I was called, then they accused me of being a legalist. A legalism is when you enforce uh, the rules and regulations. Now, add, now I may add something else. Merely you choosing to obey other rules and of, of script, other rules outside of scripture is not le living legalistically. Every believer can add his own rule of life for his own life. We don't see that. She wants to say no movies, no alcohol, no this, no that. If he limits it to his own lifestyle, that's not living a legalistic life. But as soon as he tries to enforce it on all other believers, that's when he crosses the line into legalism. And that's the key issue. So if these are your rules, you're free. If you're free the Messiah to obey him or not to obey him, but you're not, not, free, not free to disobey biblical law, but you're free to obey traditional law or disobey traditional law. But as soon as you want to enforce your traditional laws on any other believer, then you become a legalist and not tell them. Okay. Uh, very interesting, very practical and logical. Um, so here's a, another question. I read a, a book by an American Orthodox rabbi who was <coughs> responding to Christianity. Uh, I think that the book was riddled with errors and misrepresentations, but that's another topic. But one of his conclusions about Jesus, he said that Jesus was a Pharisee. Uh, most likely of the school of Shammai because of his fighting with uh, Shammai, not Hillel, on the, the marriage issue. Is it 
fair to say that Jesus was a Pharisee? Is that a misrepresentation? Uh, what's a way to respond to or interact with that accusation? Well, so Jesus was never a member of the Pharisaic party, He's never called a Pharisee, never a fellow Pharisee. When he spoke with a key Pharisee, Nicodemus, Nicodemus did not see him as a fellow Pharisee per se. Now, he followed certain teachings of the Pharisees that were more biblical, that there would be a resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not believe that. But the fact that he believed in the resurrection, that now render him to be a Pharisee. That was of that renders him to be biblical and things of that nature. But he was never a member of the Pharisaic party or the Sadducean party or the scene or any of those things. So I think he was uh, assuming something that just isn't validated by the New Testament at all and so on. So he uh, supported certain beliefs of the Pharisees, those beliefs which were biblical beliefs like the resurrection of the dead and things of that nature. And he, he did agree with the Shammai school about the divorce situation, the basis of divorce, but that but he just agreed with that school, didn't make him a member of that school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you uh, brought up some very practical uh, and biblical reasoning about marriage, what it is, uh, how to interact with adultery and all this. Uh, very important stuff these days. Marriage is under attack like, like none other. <laughs> what would you advise for a couple if they find that they are in an adulterous marriage due to say, an illegitimate divorce in the past? Uh, well, if they're already living in a relationship and they're not married and they come to me for counseling, the first thing I would tell them is um, if you're going to be serious at this, you must immediately uh, separate, live separately. You can go to, go to some premarital counseling and so on, but you must be separate from each other until we make we get you into a married state. But we're not going to do this without premarital counseling and things of that nature. That has been my advice in the past. I haven't had to deal with too many couples that were living that way because most of my ministry has been with Messianic Jews and haven't done uh, weddings all that frequently. I've done those weddings and only a couple of times do I have to tell a couple we need to separate until um, we have some counseling and we actually do the marriage ceremony. Okay. Uh, cohabitation has become the norm, really. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember when my wife and I were engaged, it was scandalous to my, my colleagues. How can you possibly be engaged if you're not even living together yet? <laughs> Completely upside down uh, exactly. order of things. Um, for the couple who has been living together for several years, they have children, uh, but they've never officially gotten married. Maybe they weren't even believers when they first met. They've become believers or whatever since then, or they've become convicted that they uh, should have some kind of a wedding ceremony. What would you advise? Is a is it possible for a couple to be in a legitimate marriage if they've only been cohabit cohabitating for several years? Well, again, uh, I'm not. There's some um, maybe in some countries um, there might be uh, after so many years you're legally recognized to be husband and wife. We've got to deal with a biblical marriage which involves commitment and which involves um, a marriage ceremony and so on. If they're already live, uh, living together, already have a family and things of that nature, I would, um, I would recommend, one, if they if they become believers, I would recommend either they just temporarily separate from each other, but uh, maintain uh, in touch with the sake of the kids and so on, or just um, separate in the same house, or perhaps in the same, or sleep in the same bed, until they are legally married, um, biblically married, in any legal ceremony. Okay. Uh, and another uh, situation, which is not as common, but not unheard of either. We have several false religions around the world, which uh, don't condemn. In fact, they may even encourage for a man to have multiple wives. So suppose uh, there is a man with two wives 
and then all three of them become believers. Yeah. What should they do about their uh, marriage situation from there? Would you advise? Well, uh, first of all, a multiple marriage actually is never never disallowed either in the Hebrew Bible or New Testament. It's only disallowed for people who want to be elders in the local church, then they're limited to one wife. So in the situation, I already know of some where you go into a mission field where there's multiple wives being practiced. But um, but you cannot tell that person biblically where you got to divorce everyone except uh, the first one you're married to. It doesn't say that. So if you have three or four wives, then you have then you have three or four wives, and it's not built good grounds. But such a person can never become an elder in the local in the new local church you're planting in the mission field. But um, multiple marriage has never been forbidden; it just has been regulated, but never forbidden. And the Mosaic Law, there was one case, a unique case, because um, uh, you, uh, you would be required to have sex intercourse with somebody or do you already have a wife? And that is, if, um, you have a, you, if you have a brother who marries but dies before having children, whether you're married or not, you have to have sexual relationship with your sister-in-law until she has a son. And then the son will inherit the property and so on of the brother that's deceased. And it doesn't say, you can only do that if your brother is also single. That's what the brother is required to have sexual intercourse with the system law until a son is born. So that's a mosaic system. So again, uh, there's an assumption that um, there was always, always one wife ever, but no, there was not that. Was some, that was not in the scriptures per se. Um, in my case, um, when I was thinking about having a second wife, that would be the second mother-in-law, and I didn't want that headache. <laughs> More wives, more mother-in-laws, right? That's, uh, <laughs> that was Solomon's mistake. <laughs> I have an excellent mother-in-law. I uh, guess I lucked out on that one. Yep. Well, my um, wife has an excellent mother-in-law as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any books that you would recommend uh, on the topic of marriage in the Old Testament, New Testament, rabbinic literature? Rabbinic literature, if uh, I mean, I have some quotations from rabbinic literature, and there is, uh, I didn't bother getting into that. Let me see if I could find it. And I know. Or any secondary literature that gives an overview of different views. Well, the writings by um, Tim Timmons, for example, one, of, one plus one. Okay. And there's some good ones, but uh, this is from uh, the, the Talmud and from the Mishnah section, which is the oldest section dating to the time of the Messiah. And here it's a discussion about. Uh, the different view of the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai. It's about two pages, three pages long, and it's from the Talmud of the land of Israel, the Jerusalem Talmud. Uh, do you want me to read some of this? Or um, perhaps just give a citation. We had someone on Facebook ask for uh, references that she could look into. Well, if he goes to the um, Jerusalem Talmud and the tractate called Sota, S-O-T-A-H, SOTH, that's where there's a lengthy discussion, the differences between Hillel and Shammai on the issue of divorce and the issue um, of marriage. Like, I'll read this. But the House of Hillel says, appropriate grounds for divorce include even a case in which the wife burnt his soup. That's grounds for divorce. And, uh, and so on. So, if you want to get the rabbinic views directly from the first source, the uh, Jerusalem Talmud is available in English. I don't know if it's available in, in your language there. And this is the uh, tractate Sota, S-O-T-H, and then you can get a lot of the material right there. Okay. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you've written a book on the uh, Song of Solomon. Did I get that right? That's correct. What's the title of that book? How do we get a copy? It's called Biblical Lovemaking. Can you okay. see this? 
already. And this is a verse by verse commentary in the Song of Solomon. And it points out that um, it's take, it should be understood literally, not allegorically, about the rabbinic view is this is shows how God loves Israel or how God loves the Torah. The Christian view normally, Christ's love for the church is neither one. <laughs> it's <laughs> literally that the, um, sex, the sexual union is, is, not, is not only to generate children and some, it's also for pleasure. And that's what I deal with verse by verse commentary in this book. So. Okay. 